Microsoft just had a pretty bad week. WannaCry is still alive and kicking. The CIA's brutal kangaroo hits the web and OpenVPN has flaws, so make sure to update. All that coming up now on ThreatWire. Greetings, I am Shannon Morse, and this is ThreatWire for June 27, 2017. This is your summary of the threats to our security, privacy, and internet freedom. Real quick, make sure to subscribe and hit that little notification bell button to see the show as soon as it goes live, and check out patreon.com slash threatwire to see how you can support the show. It's a really great way to contribute to all your favorite podcasts and artists as well. And now, on to the news. Microsoft has not been having the best of weeks. Researchers at CyberArk, which is a cybersecurity company that focuses on threats found a new rootkit attack that works against the newest forms of 64-bit Windows operating systems, including Windows 10. The rootkit can bypass built-in kernel protections found in Windows 10 operating systems that are called PatchGuard and DeviceGuard by using a flaw that is found in newer Intel processors called Processor Trace, or Intel PT for short. CyberArk calls the bypass a ghost hook, which is a post-exploitation attack, and this basically means that the attacker must already have some kind of access to the device, hence post-exploitation. Microsoft is not planning to patch the issue at this time since it would already have to be exploited to work. Now, Intel PT allows security vendors to monitor commands that work in the CPU so that they can identify any kind of attacks that happen before they actually hit the operating system. So it's actually a good thing. But because of the way that Intel PT software talks to the operating system and is implemented, it allows for Ghost Hook to secretly work without being noticed, according to CyberArk. While Microsoft isn't currently working on a patch, CyberArk will work with security vendors to ready patches. Along with this, ZDNet tested the new Windows 10 S operating system that is now available on new Surface laptops to see how it stacked up against its claims of no known ransomware running on the operating system. They asked a security researcher at Hacker House named Matthew Hickey to try it out. Hickey was able to break the security of Windows 10 S in about three hours. That's all it took. Now, while 10 S has no command prompt, no scripting tools, no PowerShell, or an ability to download apps outside of the App Store, it actually sounds really boring to me personally, Hickey was able to break the operating system by writing an exploit and saving it in a Microsoft Word document with macros enabled, which bypassed the App Store restriction. Eventually, using Metasploit, of course, he was able to get a shell with admin privileges and download a payload, allowing him to own the box. Microsoft denied the claims and said Windows 10 S has no known ransomware. Although I can see definite ways of probably getting ransomware on there. Now lastly, epic tons of Microsoft source code data was leaked online on Friday, along with images, software details, and more to the sound of 32 terabytes of information. The data was available on betaarchive.com and was from Microsoft's shared source kit, including data on Windows 10 PNP code, the operating system's USB and Wi-Fi stacks, storage drivers, and kernel code as well. In the hands of the wrong people, it could be used to find vulnerabilities to exploit in attacks. The source code that was released was for very specific customers and partners with Microsoft Windows. Obviously, it was not for the public, and Beta Archive is scrubbing much of the data from its site, and Microsoft did confirm the leak. WannaCry has not been out of the news cycle for very long, but another rash of victims has reported outages due to the ransomware attack. First off is Honda Motor Company, who stopped production at one factory in Sayama, Japan, for over 24 hours due to WannaCry infections on its network. The Sayama plant manufactures over 1,000 vehicles per day for Honda, and Honda shut down the entire plant on June 19th after finding the ransomware. They were back up and running about a day later, and according to Honda, WannaCry was found on multiple systems across their regions. Second, WannaCry also just hit 55 traffic light and speed cameras in Victoria, Australia via their private camera operator RedFlex. Patches were applied and the ransomware was removed from the affected cameras, and officials suspect a targeted attack via a USB drive as opposed to something that just happened. It's not surprising that many different businesses have probably not patched their networks yet, even though a fix is available and the ransomware was first reported on over a month ago. So patch your stuff. 
Another CIA tool has been released by WikiLeaks in their ongoing Vault 7 leaks. This one is called Brutal Kangaroo. Brutal Kangaroo makes up a suite of tools that target Microsoft Windows machines, allowing for attacks against air-gapped machines specifically. Brutal Kangaroo can be installed via an internet-connected machine inside of a target network. If a user sticks a USB flash drive into the malware-ridden machine, the drive is infected with malware as well, and then it can be moved onto other air-gapped machines without their knowing. By opening Windows Explorer while the drive is plugged in, new malware is released onto the computer. Now, if multiple machines on a network have brutal kangaroo malware infections, they will create a covert network to coordinate attacks and siphon data. Now, since Brutal Kangaroo is a suite, it does come with several different tools, including one for the thumb drive infection and one for automated infections on servers. It also comes with a persistence mechanism along with a post-processor that automates processing of different kinds of collected data. According to the documents, certain anti-malware products, like ones from Symantec and Bitdefender, would throw up flags alerting a user about the harmful malware. So far, the CIA has still not come out and said that the documents are real. OpenVPN, a popular VPN tool available for free on several different kinds of systems, had two recent security audits which were done on behalf of PIA, which is Private Internet Access, and the second by Quark's Lab with crowdfunding from the Open Source Technology Improvement Fund. The two audits found several different kinds of vulnerabilities and patches were made available for the critical issues. About a month later, Guido Vranken, a security researcher from the Netherlands, found four more security vulnerabilities vulnerabilities in OpenVPN that were not previously discovered by the two audits. Now, two of the vulnerabilities are server-side issues, and another is a client-side bug that would allow an attacker to gain proxy access on the VPN. The first critical server-side one would allow a remote attacker to authenticate with the server, send a fake certificate, and then crash the service or allow for remote code executions. The second issue takes advantage of the way OpenVPN connects to the Windows NTLM version 2 proxies. This would allow for a remote crash or stealing the user's password from a memory leak. The last two would allow for remote server crashes, and since all four of these issues were reported to OpenVPN, patches are already available. So you can download versions 2.4.3 or 2.3.17, which are both safe, at least until another security researcher finds new vulnerabilities. Yay. That's it for this episode of ThreatWire. Thank you again to everybody out there who contributes to patreon.com slash ThreatWire. Helps us keep the lights on. If you can spare a bit of change, it keeps ThreatWire completely independent and completely ad-free. We now have an audio-only RSS feed just for our patrons, extra content, and early access as well. We might even feature your adorable fur baby, just like these ones, in an upcoming episode. And remember to share your favorite security-focused news stories in the Patreon community community tab to get featured in the show on the next week. Of course, if you cannot donate, you can always hit that subscribe button. You can share this episode on your favorite social media page as well. And don't forget to use the hashtag ThreatWire so that I can see it, and then I might even retweet you. With that, I am Shannon Morris, and I will see you on the internet.